I started, I found out that I had FAS when I, the way I think, because that's not as fast as everyone else. Things do not sink in all the time until like later on. I'd read something and I wouldn't remember what I read. Uh, I'd read the bottom line before the top line. So I knew there was something wrong there. Fetal alcohol spectrum disorder is an organic brain damage resulting from a woman drinking during her pregnancy. Her offspring then may have a wide variety of disabilities, including problems with boundaries, grasping of concepts, and other learning problems. In the past, we referred to this disorder as fetal alcohol syndrome, but we found that that wasn't a wide enough umbrella concept to include the varieties of disabilities that are now included under fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. I failed first grade. Then, I don't know, I just didn't get really good marks. From what my grandma says, my mom was an alcoholic. She drank all the time. Like my thinking is not as fast as everyone else, but get used to it. My mental, my mentality is younger than I should be. And kind of awkward, kind of, when I move. FASD itself, it's on a spectrum, so different um, individuals are impacted differently because different parts of their brains are impacted by mother drinking alcohol. But it, in general, there's issues with planning, um, impulsiveness, very difficult to understand abstract concepts. Um, they're very concrete thinkers. Junior high, um, I hated. I mean, you had to switch classes all the time. You had different teachers. You had different work type assignments for different class, and like it was just too much. I had run away from home when I was 14. Like my dad had accepted me back quite a few times and then, you know, he had had enough of it. And so he signed me over to social services and basically it was, I would be running, they would finally catch me and then be put in a group home, you know, I'd eat, sleep, shower for, you know, a week or so, and then I'd be gone again. And it can affect different areas of the brain, like areas of the brain dealing with auditory or sensory processing. So if you tell them something or try to teach them something verbally, it might take them longer to process that and to understand it. And they're very impulsive too. The areas of the brain that regulate and control behavior are affected. They may look like bad children, but it's really the disability that is causing their behavior. So that's one uh, advantage of having a diagnosis. I would have to say at least 95 to 97% of the people we work with are not diagnosed. Well, I think one of the major reasons they're not getting diagnosed is that it's very expensive. Uh, to have that done, it can run anywhere from two to four thousand dollars, sometimes higher. Um, the government will pay for children to get assessments done, um, but as of yet, there is no money out there to get them done uh, for adults. In the late 90s, I went to a neuropsychologist and I had the work done then. And uh, then he gave me a big pamphlet. I went upon my own to do this. I was on, presently on day parole from Stan Daniels Healing Center at that time. And I went on my own to go see this doctor and finally get a solution, you know, because I knew something was a matter with me. My behavior, uh, just, you know, the spontaneous behaviors that I, that I did have and uh, my criminal behaviors in the past. 
and my drinking. My mother, at one point, I got really close to asking her if she drank when I was in within her womb, and I couldn't do it. But I, I, I wanted to, but as a growing man, you know, how are you going to ask your mother if she drank while, you know, while you were still in her womb? I mean, it hurt me more just to think about it, and that's as close as I got. What happened initially in Canada is that the focus became almost exclusively on Aboriginal women. And the perception that Aboriginal women were at much, much greater risk for producing children with fetal alcohol syndrome. This was not the same as what happened in the United States. The United States took on uh, the idea that it was a democratic illness in, in the sense that everybody was equally at risk. Where in Canada, we became focused almost exclusively on Aboriginal women and, and Aboriginal communities and what was happening in those communities. We should first and foremost look at the women who were most at risk, and those would be alcoholic women, regardless of whether or not they're Aboriginal. I was moved around a lot to different foster homes and. They weren't the best pet homes to be in. I was like 12, just doing petty things like still from s stores, like 7-Eleven and all that. And then as we went on, it st they started getting bigger and bigger. And sometimes me and my friend, we wouldn't even sleep. And then we did our crime so we could support our drug habits. That's how they were, it was getting. Our crimes just kept going up and up bigger bigger things so we can afford more and more drugs. They're easily led and they have difficulty with delayed gratification. By that I mean they see something, they want it, they take it without any understanding of the consequences. It's basically where opportunity presents itself. So there's a lot of property related crimes, there's, there's some trafficking possession. I mean there's, there's some assaults but as I said most of them are crimes of opportunity. At the time, I had loved it. I loved doing the crimes. I loved being with the people. I loved doing the drugs. Like, I kind of started stealing with people, and then I got caught with one person, and then I stopped stealing with people altogether. Every time that I got in trouble with the police, I, I just kind of rolled my eyes and figured, oh well, not again. Oh my gosh, what an idiot. I quit school at the, uh, in grade seven, and I was stealing cars at the age of 14, 15 years old, and uh, breaking into houses. But I was always a follower, I was never a leader. You know, somebody suggested something that sounded good, I would go with them. Most of my clients who have FASD don't commit offenses all by themselves. On occasion, I, f I find them like that. Um, and in those cases, they tend to be impulse crimes, or um, they may have, some anger issues, and something may trigger them. 1982, I was uh, charged for impaired. 1982, I was charged for B&E. And 1982, I was charged for murder. The man that I, I took his life, he was a spit and energy man who beat me up at the age of nine. And it's funny how that triggered that, you know? And it's unfortunate that uh, a lot of People are suffering because of that. Getting involved with a violent beating, you know, people look at them and they go, they don't seem to care that how badly they're beating this person. But they don't necessarily recognize that if I kick him five times instead of one, I'm going to cause more damage with five than I am with one. That's not what they think, right? Okay, my friends are still kicking them, so I'm going to kick them too. And that's the kind of process that, they, that goes through their minds, you know. So you can see how the results of their offenses look much more serious than what was happening in their minds at the time. I had been charged with assault of a police officer and my lawyer said that, you know, I have FAS and I need to get tested and all that stuff. So that's when I finally kind of got diagnosed was back then. It's important to have a diagnosis of FASD when someone's in the criminal justice system uh, for many, many reasons. The first is so that the lawyer understands 
how to properly talk to the client about what's going on. People with FASD have problems with concentration, they have problems with attention. And so if you use simple, direct language with lots of repetition, in a kind, friendly, supportive manner, they respond best to that approach. It's a very complicated system in terms of the fundamentals that underlie what you were trying to do in a criminal courtroom. And we as lawyers have to make sure our clients understand their rights. And to do that, we have to know how to speak properly to our clients and to get information properly from our clients. And if we don't understand that the client has a brain injury, really, then we can't necessarily get the right information from the client. It's very difficult. Everybody that has an impact on that client's life needs to understand the impact that FASD has on their life. Um, because it's not something that's going to go away. It's something that they're going to have to live with for the rest of their lives. Because of their brain-based disability, their memory problems, their impulsiveness, they don't understand consequences. So punishment doesn't work very well with them because they can't make that association. And um, they don't comprehend a lot of things. They may not understand what's said to them. They may be able to pair it back, but not really comprehend the meaning. Every time I go to court, I didn't understand it. Then I have to meet with my lawyer after that. And then he'll tell me what I agreed to and what I did and what I said. And the judge will be talking. But I don't know what he's saying. He just says a lot of numbers. And then he asks me what I feel about it. But I don't know what he says. So I just go, yeah. To some judges, they appear to sit there unaffected, like to show no remorse. The emotional impact doesn't hit them. They're capable of feeling remorse. You need to remember that we're dealing with the developmental age of these individuals and not the chronological age. So. We could have a 35-year-old man that we have to explain things to like a 12-year-old. So people that work with FAS or that are going to be working with FAS need to understand that there's, there's a major difference in their, their cognitive functioning. You don't want to ask for a sentence that your client cannot comply with because of the FASD. So you have to, for example, a co a probation conditions, lots and lots of conditions that are complex, you're just setting your client up to fail. So you have to think about all, all the way through the process, you have to think about it. A lot of things, in particular in the criminal justice system, it's all fault-based. It's all, it's your fault and we have to fix you. And I think if we can understand that a lot of their behaviors aren't their fault, it's really because their wires aren't connecting the same way ours are. And we can have, we should have different expectations. I'm not talking higher or lower expectations, but we should have different expectations from people who have this kind of brain damage. People with FASD often have great difficulty in prison. They have difficulty with learning, they have difficulty with social expectations and boundaries, and they often come in conflict with uh, not only the uh, officials and the guards, but they also come in conflict with the other prisoners. And because they're vulnerable, they're often taken advantage of by the other prisoners. They get their food taken from them, they get their medication taken from them, they get beat up for no reason at all. And so having FASD is a real liability within the correctional facility. I worry, as, as others do, about the experience of someone with fetal alcohol syndrome when they're in prison, in the sense that there are certain types of behavioral characteristics that they may have that may make them uh, be vulnerable to being talked into doing things um, that maybe aren't good for them. That being said, a structured environment such as a prison um, could be a place where there's an opportunity to actually give them supports and services and help them with education and other types of things because a structured environment, daily routine, is something that, that helps them to do better. We have to try to build whatever sentence that is imposed around the individual as opposed to telling that individual to contort his or her norms to the justice system norms because that won't happen and they're not physically capable. It's like telling somebody with a wheelchair to climb up the stairs. I mean, we would never do that. We would never say with someone who, who's 
disability is visible to do something that we know they cannot do. But here we're dealing with an invisible disability and we are always telling them to do things that they can't do. We don't have enough resources in the community that judges can refer these people to, like supported housing with mentors. We need more and more of that. People that understand FASD and just how much support and supervision the individuals need to stay on the right track. Uh, and yet they can do very good things if they are on the right track. And uh, w we need more and more of that. So judges have an alternative to sending them to an institution. People coming out of prison with FASD face many barriers. They might face, for example, financial difficulties, they would be isolated from their family and friends having been in prison. They might be unaware of the resources that exist for them in the community. They may have been taught by the other inmates how to commit increased crime. And they have learned a bunch of brand new friends who may not be the best influence on them. The basic premise of this program at this point in time is to help with the recidivism rate because a lot of these guys, if not all of them, have been a revolving door um, starting as early as youth, so they've been involved with the system right from a young age. If you have the right supports in place, you can make a difference. If those supports aren't there, they're just going back to the same old thing over and over and over again. What do we need to put in place so that recidivism doesn't happen? Because if you have people this, you know, um, going in and out of prison, in and out of prison their whole lives, we know that as time goes on, their health, um, their ability to be a productive member of society, their ability to connect with their family, their ability to live in a way that's meaningful for them is reduced. People who can't plan who can't uh, create their own timelines, they need somebody to do that for them. They need help. And the people who live with FASD who are the most successful that I've ever encountered are the people who A, have that help, and B, accept that help. So it's a two-way street, you know, and, and part of it is making them understand that they need the help. I don't really like help. It makes me feel like I can't do it. If, I, so if I'm independent and I can prove it to myself, I can do it, and I can do it because I did it myself. Usually, I think, between the ages of 14 and 20, you're not going to convince them that they need that help. I mean, they're like every other teenager, you know, I can do it, I can do it, and they can't do it, and that's, and that's where we're going to see all these problems. A lot of times we get them in conflict with the law, but they can graduate from that. Um, if they survive, and some of it, a lot of it is just surviving, they have to survive it. Before I found out I was pregnant, I had been doing crystal meth with my boyfriend in the basement of his parents. And then we found out, and I quit cold turkey, everything. No smoking, no drinking. Well, of course, no drinking, God. Oh, like, uh, I didn't. Anyway, um, no smoking, no drinking, no pot, nothing. I just quit cold turkey, everything. And it's been way better. This is a life change. It's not just a, it's not just a do this and everything will be better. It's a whole package. Since it is permanent, you really need ongoing supports. You can, just can't provide supported housing and mentors and teacher aides and uh, special accommodation councils and courts a and then take them away because, you know, the brain is still damaged and it can't fill in and it needs those supports. In prison, there's structure. There's three meals a day you do what you're told, when you're told, how you're told. And when you're released, that structure isn't there anymore. So you're free to, to do whatever you choose to do. So if you don't have those supports in place when they leave prison, then nine times out of 10, they're gonna go back to what they were doing before they were arrested. 
I've had full parole and day parole on several occasions. And each time of uh, <clears throat> being released in the community, alcohol played a major role in, in me coming back. It was very, very poor decision making. Knowing the circumstances, uh, I could come back for a very long time. But that, at that point in time, nothing matters but that drink. And it's not just FAS, it's alcohol. It's alcohol related, eh? You know, that disease. We have a finite number of dollars available to us to use and I think we need to look at being very, much more strategic in terms of the continuum of care. We lose a lot of what we gain by not transitioning people from one support and service into another effectively. When you're working with somebody that's severely affected, you become their external brain. You're setting everything up for them. Um, housing, finances, everything. When you're working with somebody that's a little less affected, there is ability there, it's just finding a way to enhance it and bring it out. People suggest that FASD is perhaps some sort of terminal diagnosis, that there's nothing that can be done for them, which in fact is not the case. Uh, what they need to do is recognize the disorder and learn to live with that disorder by adjusting their lifestyle to accommodate the particular problems that they face. And through education and counseling and support, they can do those things. Not everybody defines success the same way, right? So like I said, if I'm getting him up and he's dressed and his personal hygiene is good, we're good to go. And a lot of positive reinforcement. Because again, a lot of them haven't grown up with that. You know what, good job, good job. Right now I am homeless and staying at the shelters. But I'm working to get off the streets and get into a placement. I'm not doing crime no more. I don't steal no more. And I'm trying to stay away from that, that kind of things. But right now I'm trying to, I'm, I'm getting over my drug addiction. And that's pretty good so far. Going to school, staying out of trouble now. So again, how many chromosomes in our body? 23. 23, good. What are chromosomes made of? DNA. DNA, right. Good job. Awesome, good job. How much it's going, it's turning around. There's all kinds of things that can be a success. Not being involved, <laughs> it can be a success. Um, being involved and having a sentence that they comply with and don't breach is a success. Being involved and not coming back is a success. If their offense is de-escalated to something petty, then that's a success for us. So uh, we have to evaluate success depending on the person. 28 years later, I'm still serving time, you know? And I try and give back every day I can, you know, to, to honor my victims of any crime that I've committed. Exactly. And it's hard. An alcoholic person can recover. But labeling someone with fetal alcohol syndrome is suggesting that they can't recover in the context that we have. And, and my footnote would be that I think there are many people with fetal alcohol syndrome who are living quite productive lives. That's a moose. She was the one who said it. Part of me would love to go back and not care about anything and just have a non-existent life. But I mean, I look at my daughter and I couldn't imagine going back. They can be very loving individuals, great sense of humor. Um, I mean, they're just like you and I, right? Except they need a little bit more help. Let's play ball, says Coyote. What a foolish idea, says the moose. Who's there? Him? I don't remember his name. <laughs> Sorry.